We rise as we seek to enter into formal worship, and we would hear the psalmist's summons to our souls, the psalmist who says to his own soul, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, congregation of souls who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb Jesus, our help is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has made the heavens and the earth and has redeemed us by his precious blood. Receive God's blessing. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue our worship, uh, number 156. We want to turn in worship to singing to God. Now to God, our King, joy, and strength of Israel. Uh, Lofty anthems sing, glorious are his ways, to his name give praise with harp and timbrel. Let's sing the six stanzas, 156. To a people which has been redeemed from the curse and bondage of Egypt, God speaks to us today, and he speaks to us in the light of the New Testament. We are the people he would address in the light of the gospel, even, 
We have been redeemed from the bondage of sin and evil. That's our Egypt. And that's how to read the Old Testament setting here of the giving of the law. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Must have made quite an impression upon the people there. In fact, we read that when the people heard the law given at Mount Sinai, they trembled and stood afar off, and they dared not have God speak to them anymore. They said, now you speak to us, Moses, but don't let God speak to us lest we die. How different this, people of God, from the New Testament light that we have been given, the light of the glory of God revealed in Jesus that word that's spoken of mercy and of kindness and of the God who loves even us poor sinners. This is the God who addresses us today in the commandments, not to curse us, not to thunder his wrath forth so that we might never know anything of his peace and of his kindness, but in order to show us that we need him, that we are forgiven by him, that we need him in Jesus, and that now the law is the way we show our happiness in our holiness, we, the way we show our purpose in life, and it doesn't matter how old we are or how young we are, this rule is a rule for gratitude for all who would show gratitude to God. And Jesus summarizes it like this, love God. Love God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, and your soul, and love your neighbor for God's sake. That's the law, that's the prophets, that's this will of God revealed to us. May we receive it and be holy and humble and glad for Jesus. Let's sing in response to the giving of the law of God. Lord, thy word to me remember, 242.
after the service in a more casual setting. Uh, the synod did her work, and in expeditiously she was able to finish even on the Thursday night of that week that we met, a week or so ago, the first time in the history of the synods of the United Reformed Churches that we've been so expeditious and so um, speedy, and, but not hasty, in our deliberations. And the Lord was good to us there. And we should be thankful for his, his wonderful bringing of us together in a federation of like-minded believers. It really is a glorious thing to come so together, and every minister and elder delegate there, united in the faith, in the reformed faith of our fathers living still, reaching out to others with no compromise, no pride, no false humility either, but reaching out and reaching up and going forward as we seek to do the work of the Lord in establishing congregations, building up those who have been found and reaching the lost. It really is an amazing thing also to sing with all the brothers gathered uh, together there. And there were women as well who were, who were in the audience and we could join together as a church of Christ and churches of Christ. And so let's be glad for the progress that's been made and if we disagree on any decisions that have been made, we can voice them, and we can go forward together learning from one another. And so it was good to be there, but again, as I say, it is good to be back. And so we continue on in the work of the church, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Continue on together, serving the Lord and blessing His holy name for what He has done among us. I want, before we pray here to remind all of us sinners of this wonderful God who has summoned our souls in Psalm 103 in the call to worship, but who is revealed further on in Psalm 103 as this kind of God. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. What a great God and Father we have. And this God who is the God who has summoned us here to worship him and to praise him. Let's, let's pray together. Our God in heaven, our Father, our eternal Father, Father of lights, in whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning, we call upon you this day that you have made, this blessed day of your choosing, in which we could worship you and come together in these last days especially to hear the urgent call to repent and believe, and having heard and having believed, to hear from heaven the words of comfort, the words of gospel, the words of admonition, the words of truth, so that we might be built up in the most holy faith. Bless us this day, Lord. Bless us in our worship and all of the activities in between. May it be a solemn day, a happy day, for us and our children, for the members of the congregation, those who visit, may it be, Lord, truly a blessed time. For those who may be listening in on the radio or on the internet, we pray that you would use these means as well to gather, defend, and preserve your church. Lord, we pray for the mediation of Jesus and the application of the truth by the Holy Spirit so that the word that's spoken is truly effective powerful for the salvation of many. God, we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus and we're confident of Jesus' fulfillment of the promise that where two and three and whole congregations are gathered together in his name, there he is himself in the midst. And we know, Lord, that he is not with us bodily, but in his spirit, in his truth, in his promises, indeed he is here. And we pray that you would so bless us, Lord, for his sake, Remember us for the sake of the son of your love you've given, given among the sons of men whereby they must be saved, the only name, the precious name, 
which indeed is precious to us. Lord, so we pray, may the truth as it is in Jesus be that which we live by, that which is our life and enlivening power today so that we can truly be kept from sin and kept spotless and kept performing the good deeds we're called to do for we've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus and indwelt by his spirit to be a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And Lord, we pray that though we are peculiar, different, and this brings on the indignation of the enemies of the church, may we stand strong anyway. May we stand strong and witness of the truth that God is the enemy of the sinners. God himself is the one with whom we have to do. And it's not just the church against the world, but it's God against the world if they would continue to have him in derision. And we pray, Father, that you would so work and you would show even among the enemies your saving mercy. And beginning here as well and in every pulpit and congregation where there will be the preached too, who come away from the preaching and themselves become in a way, preachers themselves, ambassadors of the gospel in their lives and conversation. May we be a place of liveliness and piety and abundant fruit. May we take the example of the spring as that which we must be in as we would bear fruit, as we are planted, and as the apples and the pears and the cherries themselves are producing We pray ourselves above all people as the first fruits of this creation, the first fruits unto God, to be those who bring forth fruits of praise. May everyone here, Lord, be praying this. It's not just a mass and a a mess and a group that's praying, but individuals together. May we each, Lord, discern from you right now just how we should bear fruit what we should have cut away from our lives, what hands we should cut off, what eyes we should cut off that are leading us into sin, what companionships we should forsake because they're not friendships in the Lord, what activities we should forego because there's far better things to be doing on this earth. May we be, as a saint of old, those who are resolved to give our utmost for the highest. And so may it be, Lord, we show off that thou art the highest, not just high among many, as uh, among a pantheon of gods, but the highest, the only God, as we give our utmost, as we do this individually and personally, and as we do this in our families. We're reminded, Lord, in this day in which the culture celebrates fathers, that indeed of all people we have reason to celebrate fathers who are godly, fathers who would lead us in the way everlasting and whose birth of us is not just physically, but who seek, Father, to cause to be born again of the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ from his own, from his own family, those who are given to him. Lord, so may fathers be faithful here, younger or older. And Lord, as your servant prays who himself is a father, We all know we have a lot of repenting to do as fathers. We fall so far short. We are unworthy of the name Father because it's so so ironic that we who are fathers of children are so irresponsible, so inconsistent, and so full of torpor and slothfulness in our seeking to grow. And we're sorry for this, Lord. We're sorry for when we've fallen back and gone aside and even led our children into wrong ways. And we're, Lord, pleading with you for forgiveness in front of them, many of us even at this time, so that they can know that there is a greater work than our own works in our lives, even the work of the Holy Spirit, working repentance, working faith, working humility, and working this resolve to serve you. So may we be better fathers and grandfathers, May we also, Lord, as children, respond to your working and your teaching through fathers and mothers, your leading. And may we, Lord, whether we have physical fathers or adopted one stepfathers, we pray that you would bless us with humility and grace and honor and respect 
with the ones you appoint in our midst, in our homes, in our lives. And so may we be glad and resolute. We're going to serve God through imperfect fathers, but giving glory to the God who is perfect in his distribution of good and perfect gifts. And so, Father, as church, we pray to be as fathers to children. We pray to be leaders. We pray to know the faith of our fathers living still and not to be a, just an independent church that rises out of nothing, but to remember we go forward on the shoulders of those who've gone before, who've soldiered for the truth, who've hammered out the truth on the anvil of controversy, whose creeds we receive as a deposit of the faith, the faith of the word of God, and which we would defend as much as they are in conformity with that word. And bless us all together, Lord. May we give gladness. May we be glad and give praise to you. May we be glad for our home, glad that we can be a place for sinners to grow and for saints to grow and for all of us to glow and then to go into this world on a mission, everyone. Bless us in our struggles and trials. And even as we consider today, help us in the midst of our trials to remember you are the father of lights. And when there's trials, it's not that you are an ogre. It's not that you are making it impossible to believe and even leading us into temptation. Oh, no. You are the God who is faithful. And with trials and tribulations, you are leading us to believe and causing faith to have her perfect work and fruitfulness even in our distress. And so, Father, we're going to commit our trials, the persons of our lives whom we love who are hurting, unto you. We're going to bow before you in the light of the cross and have its shadow cast upon everything so that there might be light in that wonderful uh, influence of the cross. Lord, hear our prayers. Bless us with lively preaching and hearing. Bless us, Lord, with abundant giving and resolution to be members of Christ's church as we are at Sovereign Grace and show to show off the head of the body, even Jesus Christ. Pardon our many sins and forgive us for his sake. Amen. We worship at this time in our giving. May God bless us as we give to the cause of Christ here. O my soul, bless thou Jehovah. Let's sing a versification of that Psalm 103. Uh, Number 201, the four stanzas.
Let's together take our Bibles and open them to James chapter 1. In many ways, the book of James is unique in the, in the canon of the Scripture, focusing as it does on practical piety. In another way, it's very similar to some of the books, and especially one of the books of the Bible, and I'm thinking of Proverbs. In fact, James has been called the New Testament Proverbs, the book of practical piety. And so we learn here something that is similar to what the Bible teaches everywhere, but also there's a special focus in the book of James that religion might be shown and that faith might have the good works that are the fruit of true and living faith. Let's read that in that light, in that perspective that James gives us and the inspired uh, James gives us so that we ourselves can say, yes, I need this word. I need this word more practically on the ground to be a Christian. And so, the Word of God, James 1, and let's read uh, through verses 1 through 18. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind." For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits." Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of, the, of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That's as far as we'll read. May the Lord bless us in our reading of this book of practical piety. And especially as we consider verse 17 and also in light of verse 18, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there, there is no variation or shadow of turning. And then this of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. As I said, uh, people of God, and we, we know this, Most of us, I'm sure, are familiar with the Bible. See, James as a very practical book. That is a book of how to live Christianity and especially a book of uh, calling us and urging us to live Christian lives and bear fruit in all of our lives. And so that's the focus of James. It's the focus of God, the Holy Spirit, who inspired James. Some have seen James is inconsistent with Paul and justification by faith and as he teaches in Romans and Galatians, but there is a godly consistency here, a spirit-inspired consistency. James is saying we're justified by faith alone, but by a faith that is never alone. It always is accompanied by 
the good works of faith that God works in us. But now, James deals with a people that needs to be told that. And specifically, he's addressing what are called the 12 tribes scattered abroad, James 1.1. 1, 1. And I believe that's a reference to Jewish believers who were part of the diaspora, who never came back and resided in Jerusalem, but they're scattered abroad as lights in all of the world of the truth now as it is in Jesus. And James writes to them, and he writes to us of this practical piety, but he's meeting us on the ground. And that's the wonderful wisdom of the Scripture. God speaks his heavenly word. It comes from above to earthly writers, to us on the ground. It meets us here, and it meets us in all of the practical difficulties of being Christian. For children, for fathers, for mothers, for single people, for those eking out a living, for those who have abundant uh, Uh, abundance of things of the earth and those who have little, those sick, those sorrowing, all kinds of people. God speaks to us this word in our ground. And so we need to hear this for practical Christianity because what James is doing right in our text here is addressing one of the great difficulties of being Christian and fruitful in this world and on our ground. And that is this, the difficulties of trials. And as you recall what we've just read here in James 1, he's already introduced the, the idea of trials, not the idea only, but the fact of trials in our life. When he says in the, first, the second verse, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into them, when you fall into various trials. And so he's meeting us, meeting the people then and meeting us today when we're struggling and when we're prone to to wander in our struggles and to wonder in our struggles and to be wicked in our struggles. That's what James is is addressing here. And so in the context, the immediate context of our our, our trial, I'm saying of our text, verse 12 and following, he's speaking again of this man who endures temptation. He's urging us on. When he's approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. But then he's warning us, let no one say when he's tempted or tried, I'm tempted by God, as if God brings trials and struggles to get us to sin so that it's like a trap, so that there's no way out and, and God is is like an ogre sadistically bringing on all of the events in our life and the circumstances so that we can do nothing but evil. Oh, no. Perish the thought, the Apostle James says. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Nothing there of God. And his being the author of sin and the promoter of evil. But everything there for a healthy understanding of the process and origination of sin. You'll note even, in that passage just before our text, there's no mention of the devil. Yes, the devil is in every sin and evil thing, but there's every mention of ourselves. There's a healthy understanding of the fact that we are the aids and allies of sin in as much as we are left to our own ways and inclined to all evil, as our catechism reminds us we still are. And so you have this right from the beginning. In the face of trials, we having to deal with them honorably and theologically and not at all blaming God for our problems and perhaps for our fruitless Christianity. Instead, as our text reminds us, let's look to God. Let's look to God, who our text says is the Father of lights and who gives good gifts and perfect gifts. And maybe, just maybe, in trials, He's giving good and perfect gifts right now, gifts that we don't even recognize but should. So let's consider the father of good and perfect gifts. And, yes, of course, we want to lead the way here on Father's Day and lead the way as the first fruits of God's creation, those who are the church of Christ and not just among this world and its cultured elite who set aside days 
in respect of fathers. We want to honor God the Father and also then the fathers who bring us to God, the Father of good and perfect gifts. What Father truth on high? We want to consider that first of all. What theology is there in this verse 17? Every good gift and every perfect gift from above and so on. What is the truth there? Then secondly, what Father truth is there on our ground? We want to consider there how God shows himself to be Father among us. And then finally, what father truth is there among us? And some practical, practical lessons we can glean from this, tre- uh, this, uh, this text here about being proper children of the Father of heaven. Well, it is striking that the Apostle James in this very practical book, dealing with an ugly thing, trials and temptations and, and all of these things that happen to us and make our lives thorny, and ugly, and sad often. He deals with theology. That's what the apostle is led by the Spirit to remind us of. Some good practical counsel here, isn't there? Let no one say when he's tempted he's drawn by his own, or or each one when he's tempted say he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed and so on. And do not be seen, my beloved brethren, It's not God who's doing this. It's not God. That's the burden of our text. You only have to blame yourself in the trials and temptations and when you fall into the temptation to sin. Only to blame yourself. Take full responsibility. That's what James is saying here. Before you're going to be considering any kind of good work in any kind of season of your life and being fruitful in faith, let's get this right, James is saying. And let's get this right in the, in the midst of the hardest of things. You see, James is playing hardball here, as, as we would say in the, in the, uh, the parlance of this day. He's, he's dealing hard and, and, and truthful with these people so that they get it in the hardest of circumstances. Yes, we are called to be practical Christians and practical Christians exactly because we have God who is a great and good and perfect Father. That's the the connection I would make between what he's been saying about our temptation and trials and this text, our God is the God of good gifts. He's the Father of lights. Well, he's the Father of lights inasmuch as he is the Father of the sun and the moon and the stars. I think that's a reference there. He's the Father of all the created things that twinkle in the heavens, whether it's a sun that has this light that God gives in this energy or a moon that reflects the light of the sun. No matter, God is the father of those things, those light bearers that he made originally when he said, let there be light even before there was a light bearer. But then on the fourth day when he gave light bearers, the the sun and then the moon and the stars to reflect something of the glory of God. And that's really the point here, I believe. Uh, James is speaking metaphorically here, if we could say that. He's speaking of God, the creator of lights, but also that he's the, the father of good things in this earth, of all goodness, because light in the Bible is a symbol of good, of purity, of peace, of joy, and of everything that's full of praise. People in the darkness are those who have no hope, who are ignorant, and who are of the devil, who are the who is the prince of darkness. But God is the father of lights, of every good and perfect gift. He is the giver. He is this wonderful God in whom is no darkness whatsoever. John says in 1 John 1, verse 5, God is light, and in him is no darkness whatsoever. There's nothing impure about him. And so when he creates everything, he cannot create impurities. When he creates circumstances and guides this and that and the other thing. And this gun and that uh, person who's deluded to meet and so that the person who's deluded squeezes the trigger. God, who arranges the circumstances, is nevertheless not the author of the evil that that the deluded person may do. He's the father of lights. We have to say that. And that is the theological truth which people must run up hard against and must deal with in trials. 
God is not the author of sin. Even though he's sovereign, even though he's great, even though he's the king of kings, and we sang of him in our opening song, we said, king of kings, enter this place, be thou the God of this place. What do we mean? We mean he is absolutely in control of everything. Even as he was in control of that greatest of evil, the cross, he foreordained it. Nevertheless, this father of lights and that great and significant and yet evil event of men who by wicked hands tore the Savior from this earth and crucified him. Father is the father of lights and had nothing to do ethically and responsibly for the immorality of wicked men. That's what James is saying here. Don't blame God. He's the father of everything good in this world, everything of praise, everything of good report, anything that bespeaks the image of God in man, anything that bespeaks his glory in creation. And yes, there's a lot there. The heavens declare the glory of God. That's why, by the way, light and glory often go hand in hand in the scripture. Isaiah 60, for example, light of God, when it comes, is the agent of the revelation of the glory of God. And the glory of God is the greatness of God. So when the text says God is the father of lights, it's saying he is the originator of lights that shine and twinkle and bespeak his glory, his greatness. Oh, that we would see this in the glorious summer days or spring days that we're having. In the time of growing and fruitfulness. Oh, that we would see the father of lights, who's the, the author of these things, and every good uh, song of a bird, and every good hymn of a man. God is to be praised for these things. He gives good and perfect gifts. That's what the James starts out with here. He gives good and perfect gifts. In fact, every good and every perfect gift that's the implication here, is of God. Everything good in this earth, everything perfect on this earth is of God. And there's two different words there for gift, and, and um, two, uh, one word for good and one word for perfect, and they're very similar, but you can read them together this way and say every good gift and every purposeful gift, that's the word there, telios, is from above, from God. So, in other words, James is saying God, when he gives good things, good things in the earth, has purposes in his giving them. They're good and they're purposeful. And I dare say he's even alluding to trials, the hard things that we have a hard time seeing light in, the dark tunnels. We can hardly see the light at the end of the tunnel. Even in them, God is giving good and perfect gifts to the soul, so that the soul is led to God. And note here, that's why James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You see, when there's darkness in your life, there's still the Father of lights ruling. There's still the Father of lights guiding. There's still the Father of lights wisdom and his purpose to work patience in your faith in this test, in this trial, and so God is this God. Never to be blamed, always to be acknowledged as good, the Father of lights, the Father of his good in creation, the Father of good spiritual and moral, and he gives good and perfect gifts to just to show how holy and pure and kind and loving he is. And the text goes on to say, with this God, there's no variation or shadow of turning. Now, that's a rather peculiar way of saying that God never changes. But I believe he's alluding perhaps to the, the things that the lights that God creates, like the sun and the moon and the stars, and how they are lights indeed, but how they can cast shadows, and how suns can rise and suns can set, and the light, to us anyway, seems to go out. And how among the sun, the moon, and the stars, there can be obscuration or the obscurity of clouds, sometimes eclipses, that can make 
from our perspective, the sun dark. Well, I believe what the Apostle James is doing here is comparing and contrasting God, the Father of lights, who is, yes, indeed, the Father of stars and moon and so on, and we can learn something of his light from them, but who is far greater than them. With him, there's no rising, there's no setting. With God, there's no eclipse. With God, there's nothing that can obscure his goodness and his mercy and his kindness. Nothing, no nothing. And even in the darkest of hours, in the darkest and days of infamy, there is God who is famous for shining in the darkness. Isn't this wonderful? The truth, the theological truth that James is adducing right here, offering up for evidence that we might not blame God in the trials, but nevertheless find him to be the father of our trials in a good sense, in an enlightening sense, so that we know even in trials he's invariably there, sovereignly there, and even there in love. Now, the second point I want to consider with you is a sad and sordid fact. So many have rejected God as the father of lights. So many do reject him. They blame God. They curse God. They're like Job's wife. Job gets into a pinch, to say the least, and they say, curse God and die. Everything might be going well, and they'll have a theoretical theology and acknowledgement of God, but when it comes time to suffering, and even suffering for God's sake, they reject him. So much is their trouble and rejection of the Father of lights in this world. The whole world, in fact, is given over to the darkness of the evil one. And darkness is not only ignorance, it's willing rejection of God the Father. Willing rejection of the Father of lights. Willing rejection that he is the originator of everything good. Instead, human beings say, we are the authors of good and evil. If there is such a thing, well, maybe that's in the genes or in the DNA. Maybe that's just a quirk of nature. But it's certainly not something that's evil against a God whose standard is forever, as we shall see in the sermon tonight, the God who is our light and whose morality is the morality we are to live by. But people reject God, one reason or another. And the apostle is saying, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And remember, in fact, that God, the Father of lights, is the Father of Jesus. That's what he's getting to in this text, reminding the people of God, the 12 tribes scattered abroad, reminding them that God, the Father of lights, was the Father of a Son, even before He was the Father of the lights on the earth. The Eternal Father of the Eternal Son, begotten before the worlds, whose goings forth have been from everlasting. But this God, who is the Father of lights, has seen fit in His determinate counsel to decree that the Son of His eternity would come into the earth and he would be here for sinners, and he would deal with the trouble, deal with the trials, and he would redeem them all, redeeming his people from sin. That's what James is saying. You see, James, not at all in contradiction of Paul the apostle who champions justification by faith alone and the blood of the Lamb, rather is, is saying that at the basis of practical Christianity is this, this Father of lights is the Father of Jesus. And, as he will say in verse 18, this one who is the Father of lights and the Father of Jesus is our Father of his own will, he says. He begat us, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That's what he's getting at, is the motivation for every good work. And what we would get at in every sermon, every day, and in every way that we can here. The motivation for your good work and to be a good church is remember God the Father of Jesus and our Father for his sake. You see that? Right at the heart of the motivation for being faithful in the hardest of times 
is remembering that God is our Father for the sake of Jesus. And remembering that by his own will, by his sovereign and glorious will, and not by the free will of man, as many say, but by his own will, note that in verse 18, proof positive that there's nothing of the free will of man in our regeneration, but of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, by the gospel. That's how the Bible describes the word of truth in other passages. The word of truth is the gospel, the good news that God saves sinners. God did this. God who created the sun and the moon and the stars took notice of us sinners and he came into our darkness so that not just out of nothing but out of darkness and evil he made us whole out of death he rose us from the dead and he has begotten us again. Do you know that, beloved? This is by the gospel, he says, the agency of the truth of salvation that the Spirit uses to quicken the lives and to call to conscious fruition the lives of the people of God. God is the Father of lights, and he's your Father and my Father, if we be believers. Because the fruit of those who are born again is that they believe, and the fruit of those who believe, is that they bear good fruit, that they take it not willy-nilly or haphazardly that they are in a Christian church, but very responsibly. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You see that? The Apostle James is getting right at the heart of our identity as God's people. And so he reminds us of God who's great and who's perfect and God who's merciful, God who's lovely, God who's this God who's not only sovereign over trials but who's sovereign and loving in saving us so that we're his. What a great and glorious day on Sunday to be for us for we celebrate Father's Day, then, every Sunday. Father's Day. As we come into church, we call our souls with the psalmist to bless the Lord, O my soul, because he's my Father. This God who's God, who I will not deny in my trials, is still God. He's the Father of lights, is my God and my Father. That's what we're here about, celebrating the God of the Old and New Testament, the God of eternity who has entered, intersected our time and become our Father. Beautiful. And he makes many sons, many daughters, and the gospel word goes out. And indeed, then we see that every one of his good gifts and every perfect gift that's from above is now to make us fruitful. That's why God gives good and perfect gifts. Oftentimes in the trials, oftentimes in chastisements. Why? So that we might be fruitful. Anything in your life right now, that's a burden, that's a struggle, that's a difficulty. Do you see it as a good gift because God is your Father? See that? A trial in your marriage, a trial in your, among your children, a trial in your own soul, a trial of habit, a trial of addiction, a trial of this, a trial of that, a trial of a bad economy, a trial and even a temptation because you're weak. This is how we're to see this. We are those who believe that God is in control that he's not evil, that he is good, and with the temptation, because he's our father and we are his sons, and of his own will, all by himself, according to his counsel, he has borne us again, we are to believe that now, in everything, he's giving to us freely as a wonderful inheritance and also as an opportunity, everything. And he's sanctifying the things, even the hard things, so that we can believe all the more. And so James says, count it all joy when you fall even into various trials because God is at work. He must love you a lot. He trusts his own faith in you that it's not going to break you. 
He trusts his own faith in you that it's going to work you to see that you're not brought into a tight spot and no way out. He's going to say, no, here's the way out. Here's the way of escape. Here's the way of patience. Here's the way of love. Here's the way not of being bitter, but of being and growing better in the trial. God is like that. We see that. It's truth on the ground, people of God. And truth on the ground in these good and perfect gifts of the Father of lights, our Father, so that we become, as James says, is the purpose of our being born again, a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You see that in verse 18, the whole purpose of our being born again by this Father of lights is that we may be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now that is an Old Testament allusion to the crops that were presented to God as a dedication of the harvest. At the first part of the harvest, barley or wheat or so on, sheaf of these things would be dedicated to God. And they would be the best of the harvest, they would be the first of the harvest, not only, but the pledge of more to come. And here, the apostle is saying, that's what we are, and that's what the purpose of our being born again is. That we might be, of all the creatures of this earth, of everything, leading the way as those who are these works of God, these praises to God in our lives, dedicated to his service and honor to him, even as Christ himself, the head of all creation and of the church, is an honor to God. Now, we are the first fruits of all the creatures. Isn't that a noble position we're in? James says that. We are those who are born again to be just that, not to be idle, but to be fruitful, to be a part of the fruit of God, to show that God is living in the summer, the winter, the fall, and the spring. And I want to make application here. Application on this Father's Day as well. Because one of the principal ways that God the Father shows fruitfulness in our lives is by earthly fathers. In the home, for, for example, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. And chief among those chief uh, good and perfect gifts are fathers. Not good and perfect fathers in the absolute sense of the word, but fathers who are fathers. They are good gifts. I hope you recognize that. Sadly, in our day, fathers are so demented and diverted from their calling to be good fathers and faithful to God the Father that it's hard for people Hard, very hard for children in this generation X, Y, or Z, or whatever it is. Let's call it genera generation fatherless. It's hard for them to believe that God the Father, if there is a God, they say, is represented by earthly fathers. You think of it. Think of that. Fathers today forsake their mothers, and they shack up with someone else. They go and they marry someone else. They have other children elsewhere. Fathers today, they're addicted to this or that or the other thing. Or they work and then they come home and plop before the television and that's all they do. Fathers today have no understanding of the Word of God or if they do, they twist and distort the Scriptures to their own end. Fathers today are militant against true fatherhood in being open to all kinds of arrangements that are not the arrangements of God in godly marriage. Fathers today are deadbeats. Fathers today are irresponsible. Fathers today would have not a clue that God is God over everything. And they don't want a clue because they're far from God. Well, I still stand by my statement. Fathers are good and perfect gifts. Fathers per se. Fathers as created by God to be fathers, regardless of their morality, their capability, whatever, they're in a position 
That's a good position to be in. It's a, it's a holy place in itself. Even as mothers are in this place of motherhood, so fathers are in this place of fatherhood. That's why there's a fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother. Not because they're perfect, not because they're honorable in themselves, but because God puts them there. This is the basis of all honoring of authority. The position, the badge, and not the height or the brawn of the policeman. The authority, the position that God gives to them. So fathers, in the home, in godly homes, we even have the great privilege of praising God for fathers who are good. Fathers who love God the Father. Many of us do. What a great blessing. Grandfathers. Great-great-grandfathers. Great-great-great-grandfathers. Uncles and so on. But fathers who love God, who worked all their life long, maybe at a simple job, or maybe they were high-tech, or maybe they were out of work, whatever. didn't matter. They love the Lord. And we saw them, yes, we saw them in all their imperfections. We saw them when they were down. We saw them when they compromised. Indeed, we see them even now in our church and in all the land, Christian fathers who are far from perfect, who are lackadaisical about their Christianity, and yet who keep on coming back, who keep on praying, who keep on saying, Lord, forgive me. And we see that too. That's a great gift. That is a great gift. And there's a calling here to us fathers. You ever see that? I hope we take that to heart. The Bible presents God as a father, that he might be seen as wonderful and great, but also as an example. He's a father of lights, for example. So we should be. We should be, in the earthly sense, a father of good things. Father, from whom comes good words, not the philosophies of men, but good words, not just silly things or jokes, but good and wholesome words. That's what fatherhood is all about. James will be talking about the, the tongue in James 3, how restless and evil is it? Well, a man in the home is to be one who is under the control of the spirit so that he controls his tongue and positively that he speaks the words of life to his children. And this is how even we are agents of the begetting of God the Father as we bring the gospel. Verse 18, of his own will begat he us by the word of truth. Yes, often through fathers, through fathers who bring us this word, who read this word seriously, explain it to us in our homes, and then who lead us to church where we can learn of God the Father and hear him and our children can hear him. This is what fathers are to do. And God, the Father, is one in whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Well, that means, men, we are to be immutable after a fashion, consistent in godliness in everything in our lives. That's what God is. How about us? Or are we light here at church and have a bright countenance and then we turn into ogres when we go down the road? or ogres when we're in private in some other capacity. No, as God, we are to be consistent. Are we fair-weather Christians as men and fathers? God is not a fair-weather God. He's an all-weather God. Leads us through every storm. And so we stand up in every storm, every trial, every success, and we say, praise God. That's what a father does. And yes, a father gives good and perfect gifts too just like God the Father, to lead the home to glory. Yes, that might be, that may, that might be a, an American girl doll, or whatever they call it. It might be. It might be all kinds of other good things for the girls or for the boys. It might be a, a car one of these days. It might be an allowance. It might be work to do, whatever. It might even be, however, chastening. Fathers on this earth, let's be those who give to our children 
good and perfect gifts, who give freely things they don't deserve, our children, but who give, who give to our wives, first of all, and then to our children, who give and who give and who give, who are known as givers. That's what God is, but we give good and perfect gifts, things that aim toward the purpose of salvation of the flock that's entrusted to us. In the church, of course, it's the same way. Elders, we're called to be as fathers to the flock, brothers and fathers, elderly in the flock. You're called to be a good example of those who are content not only but full of joy, who know you're not on this shelf in any way whatsoever, but are a vital component to this family at Sovereign Grace, are called to be here and committed and caring and kind to the children, to the grandchildren, to all who may come into this place. Oh, what a wonderful position and calling we have. So fathers we are, but also this, recognizing that we have a faith of our fathers, that is, fathers way back when, who stood for the truth, who hammered it out in their creeds, and so we sing faith of our fathers living still presently. Yes, it is, isn't it? So a church that is known for its extolation of God the Father has fathers to teach them. This is all you see for practical Christianity. Not for whirlwind, meteoric Christianity that's, that's high and hyped today because we found a new thing, but then tomorrow is gone. No, we're for the Christianity that's hot and steady and burning and vibrant based on the truth, the truth of God, the truth of who we are. God's sons, God's daughters, praise God the Father. It's his day. And for the many fathers who lead him or to, who lead us to him, amen. Our praises be to you, Lord. You are our Father, wonderful Father. We thank you, Lord, for being invariable. You never change. You're so good. You're so perfect. Nothing affects you and thwarts your purposes. We thank you, Lord, for earthly fathers who lead us to you. And we pray that all of us together may be glad, glad this day in celebration and showing forth the fruit of this Christianity that you intended to be real, that you intended to be something that is a great delight for us to have, a pure religion and undefiled it shows truth from on high on our ground in great fruitfulness, even as the first fruits, your church in all the creation. Bless us and give us thanks. For Jesus' sake, amen. 443, the faith of our fathers.
receive God the Father's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to this broadcast of Sovereign Grace United Reformed Church. Sovereign Grace Church, served by the ministry of Reverend Mitchell Dick, worships each Lord's Day at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. at the chapel of Kuiper College, located at 3333 East Belt Line Northeast, between Three Mile and Four Mile Roads. You are most cordially welcome to join us for worship or visit us online at www.sgurc.org or contact us by phone at 616-406-8562. It is our prayer that the Lord would add His indispensable blessing to this ministry in order that His name would be glorified through the edification of His people and the translation of sinners out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son.